Oh, we're, oh, I have to use the microphone. I always forget about that. Okay. All right. This it comes out of the thing, though, right? Um, okay. Uh, I also couldn't. I also didn't stop saying the word "fuck" in front of my mother when she came to see me. And if actually, if you see Instagram today, uh, the Olio Instagram feed has a picture of me flicking off the camera, and the woman smiling in the chair off to the side is my mom. Um, it's it's definitely my favorite picture of me and my mom. Um, uh, I have handouts. Uh, Chris and David, I have handouts. I forgot to tell you that. Can you hand these out? All right, I'm giving because it's gonna be faster like that. And also, I need one. Um, I just, I'm just doing a kind of, uh, I, I'm interested in a couple of moments. Uh, well, I'm gonna start with this. There's a, there's a, a part of Game of Thrones that I, I really found to be a kind of very dramatic piece of wisdom. And Game of Thrones, you know, Game of Thrones is famous for being like violent and absurd and everybody dies, uh, you know, and it's this kind of fuck you to J.R.R. Tolkien, right? The whole thing is, the whole point of Game of Thrones is screw you to Lord of the Rings, right? That, that Gan spoiler alert, Gandalf dies and then he comes back because um, he's Jesus or whatever. So the whole point of the whole point of Game of Thrones is, and, 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 it, and it takes some of the it takes some of the drama away, right? Because this wise father figure returns to help them. Whereas in Game of Thrones, it's like, no, these people just they just died. The the person you thought was the main character is dead, and a bunch of other people died too. Good luck. Um, and it, it's it's a it's a kind of screw you to that. And and the show is famous mostly for its sex and for its bloodshed. Um, but there's a moment in it that I I, I think has a, a radical bit of wisdom that I I have not really been able to shake since. I saw it, and it's a really minor moment. It's a it's a story uh, that Varys, who's almost, almost certainly my favorite character. Um, no, that's not true. It's Natalie Dormer. I really like Natalie Dormer. Um, the the Ver Lord Varys is the spy master, and he's talking to Tyrion, and he tells Tyrion a parable. It's a little longer in the book than it is in the show, although it is in the show. Um, and I printed the parable on the top of the thing. And you don't. You, I mean, I you can take it home now. I guess I don't really know what I'm doing with the handouts today. Um, but he says, uh, he tells a story. He says, in a room sit three great men, a king, a priest, and a rich man with his gold. Between them stands a sellsword. It's like a, like a freelance soldier. Between them stands a sellsword, a little man of common birth and no great mind. Each of the great ones bids him slay the other two. Do it, says the king, for I am your lawful ruler. Do it, says the priest, for I command you in the names of the gods. Do it, says the rich man, and all this gold shall be yours. So tell me, who lives and who dies? Who will the swordsman obey? It's a riddle without an answer, or rather, too many answers. It all depends on the man with the sword. And yet, he is no one. He has neither crown, nor gold, nor favor of the gods, only a piece of pointed steel. That piece of steel is the power of life and death. Yet if it is the swordsmen who rule us in truth, why do we pretend our kings hold the power? Why should a strong man with a sword ever obey? Then these swordsmen have the true power. Or do they? Whence came their swords? Why did they obey? Some say knowledge is power. Some tell us that all power comes from the gods. Others say it derives from law. Power resides where men believe it resides. No more, no less. Power is a shadow on the wall, yet shadows can kill. And oft times, a very small man can cast a very large shadow. I give my students extra credit if they don't identify me as the very small man who casts a very large shadow. Um, uh, the the, the passage is dramatic, and it's one of those things, you know, I, I sort of read it, and I saw it, and I thought about it, and it just, it, I couldn't quite shake it. It's a really interesting idea, and it's become like, almost like a mantra that I, it's always in my head at all times when all kinds of bad things happen. Um, <clears throat> which is that, right, the, the, you, you have the rich man and the, ki and the king uh, and the priest, right, and they're commanding this just random guy, this regular guy, to do what they say. And these are people that are obviously the powerful people, right? You think about the priest and the rich guy and the king as being the most powerful people in the kingdom. But crucially, what the parable points out is that what the swordsman, how does the swordsman make his choice, right? Who's he going to obey? Is he going to obey the rich guy? Is he going to obey the priest? Or is he going to obey uh, the king? And the, the way he makes the decision is based entirely on what he believes, right? If he believes money is the most important thing in the world, then he's going to obey the he's going to obey the rich guy. And if he if he's a religious man and thinks that God is where he owes most of his loyalty, he's going to follow the priest. Um, and if he believes sort of law and order and the king is the most important, he's going to follow that. And it's it's interesting to think about that that the 
So you think of these guys as being powerful, but 100% of their power comes from the belief of the regular guy in them. And if he has a different belief, they lose all their power immediately. Um, and you see this, all the, there's hundreds of examples. But if you've ever tried, you ever try to get like a little kid to eat vegetables? And then you go, well, if you eat the broccoli, you can have dessert. And then the kid goes, I don't want dessert. You lost. <laughs> That's it. There's no, you have no more moves. That's, that was your move, right? You can use the cake as leverage, but cake only works as leverage if, per, if the person wants the cake. As soon as they don't want the cake anymore, you, you, you the adult, the smart one, um, has lost all the leverage over the kid. Or if you've ever had like um, serious religious people um, sort of harass you about things, oh, if you do that, you're going to hell. I don't believe in hell. It's, well, you, if you don't believe in hell, you're definitely going to hell. Like, well, see my earlier comment, though. It doesn't, right? It short circuits, right? They lose. The, the priests only have power. Religious people only have power over believers. As soon as you go, no, I'm, I'm not, I don't, that's, you're making that up. That's not a real thing. A hundred percent of the leverage, a hundred percent of the leverage of heaven and hell goes away as soon as you withdraw your investment in that story. Um, it completely vanishes on. And this, I mean, just all day. I'm sure you've seen movies where some badass action hero, you know, you got the, you got the bad guys taking some girl hostage, right? You know, uh, you know, let me get out of here or I'm going to shoot the girl. What if the hero shoots the girl? What are you going to do now? That's it. You have, that was a human shield. It, the human shield only works if the person you're fighting against values human life. If they don't, then that person is not a shield. It's just something I'm going to shoot through to get to you. Um, that you're, that it, it points out the ways in which your, your investment in things is what gives those things power over you. Um, and that if you withdraw your investment of those things, you gain for yourself a lot of power. And it comes at a cost, right? Because now you're no longer participating in things other people are participating in. Um, uh, but it's a, very, it's a very kind of dramatic point about everybody who has power over you has power over you because you gave it to them. Um, so for example, my students are very concerned. We talk about, uh, so I give them examples of like, you ever been at a job where you gave your two weeks notice? Right, you can do anything, right? You don't need the paycheck anymore. You, they're, they, you're leaving, you're done. And it's like, it's a fun zone where like you can actually just do, you, they have, they've lost all their leverage over you because you no longer need them. Um, and so it's interesting to think about the ways in which a huge amount of structure in society is built off of your investment in other things. Like, money works like that, doesn't it? I mean, why, why are nickels bigger than dimes? Right? I mean, dimes are worth twice as much as nickels, so shouldn't they be the bigger ones? Right, but it's 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 arbitrary, right? You you've you've invested in it. You believe dimes are more valuable than nickels because everybody believes they're more valuable than nickels. And if people stopped believing that, it wouldn't work. Um, and with <laughs> and it, it, the, the whole money system falls apart because it's it's symbolic, right? I mean, you can imagine somebody come from Neptune and looking at a twenty dollar bill and a five dollar bill, and they look very similar. It's just a, they just change a couple of numbers on there, right? But it, we've all invested. Everyone's agreed. It's like a it's a social construction that we've all agreed that money works like this and symbolizes these things. And if somebody didn't do that, we would lose our minds. And the, my favorite example of this, and of course, and the person who deinvests, who, who withdraws their investment from everything um, in the most dramatic way possible is the Joker in Dark Knight. And that's why the Joker is hands down the greatest villain, really one of the greatest modern villains we've ever had. Uh, because what makes him scary isn't that he has laser beam eyes or something, or he can crush your skull. It's that he, you can do what he's doing by withdrawing your investment in stuff. Um, he burns the money. That's the most dramatic moment in the movie is he, he, he sets the money on fire at which it, he can't be bribed, right? Someone that's gonna set money on fire, can't, you can't pay him to stop. Um, it's, it's what makes him so terrifying and so kind of unstoppable. But what I was interested in is a moment um, from Hamlet, if I can kind of skip around a little bit. Um, which which kind of enlarges this conversation in an interesting way. Um, and, and you have it at the, it's the next quote on the thing. Um, Ro Hamlet has, uh, if, if you know Hamlet, Hamlet has uh, killed Polonius, and Claudius wants to know where Polonius' body is, because he's hidden it. Uh, Rosencrantz, what have you done with the, what have you done, my lord, with the dead body? Compounded it to dust, where to it is kin. Like, that's not what he wanted to know. He wanted a location. Um, my lord, you must tell us where the body is and go with us to the king. 
the body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. Hamlet just fucks with people for the entire play. He just scre- he makes these obscure jokes, and nobody understands them until he meets the gravedigger. It's a nice little detail that Shakespeare, who was a regular person and wrote regular plays, and that Hamlet is the smart guy, and the only guy who can outsmart Hamlet is a regular guy, the gravedigger. All the nobles and learned people have no fucking clue what he's talking about. The gravedigger gets it, but that's later in the play. Um, but he's, Hamlet says, the body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. And that's a, that's a pun. He, it's, a, it's a joke. Um, what he means is that Polonius' dead body is with the king, meaning it's in the castle somewhere. But the king is not with the body because the king doesn't know where it is. But the other level of the joke is that the body is with the king, meaning the body politic, the public, is on the side of the king because they think he's the king and supports them. But the king is not with the body, meaning the king does not have the best interests of the body politic and the population in mind. Uh, so, that, so that he's tricking them into, right? Because he's, because t- Claudius is, spoiler alert, Claudius has taken the throne by killing Hamlet's dad. Um, so the body is with the king, meaning the people support Claudius, but, Claudius the, but the king is not with the body. He doesn't support them back. He's a bad king. He's not the real king. Um, and then Hamlet says this crazy thing, and it's one of my favorite lines in all of Hamlet, and it's a little blink and you'll miss it moment. It's hard to emphasize in performance. Um, but Hamlet says, the king is a thing, a thing, my lord, of nothing. Um, one of my, and, and of course Hamlet is obsessed with performance. Um, he, he, does, he has a whole play within a play. He knows, he gets very excited when the actors come. He knows all the jargon and all the things uh, nope, it's back. Um, he knows all kinds of things about acting, uh, and he's very interested in performance, but all of his acting and performance interests unlocks a sort of crucial truth to him. Um, there's a short story writer, uh, Borges, you may have heard of him before, he's, one of, he's, he's fantastic, um, but he has a line in a story about Shakespeare um, that is kind of an amazing thing, and it starts off by sounding really stupid, and then it gets suddenly very, very smart. He defines an actor. He says, Borges says that an actor is a person who stands on a stage and pretends to be another person, obviously, in front of an audience of people who pretend to take him for that person. That's interesting, right? Because you think of, the, you think of what does an actor do? An actor pretends. But you forget that actually it's you doing the pretending, right? You're the one that's pretending, right? Chris, I, I'm Batman. You can't go, that's not Batman. That's Christian Bale. He was in Newsies. He was in Newsies, by the way. Um, right, but you, that destroys you. you. So Christian Bale's pretending he's Batman, but you are also pretending he's Batman. And if you stop doing that, the movie falls apart and the people will throw you out of the movie theater for complaining about all the, why is he lying? Um, by the way, if you look at the, the etymology, the word history of the word hypocrite, right, which is somebody who says one thing and means something else, follow it all the way back to ancient Greece. And you know what it means? Actor. It's an actor. An actor is a hypocrite because an actor is a person who says, I'm Batman. But he's not Batman. He's just, he's lying. Um, So what Hamlet has realized here is that there's, uh, that all authority works like that. The king is like that. Because how do you get to be king, right? There's no like kingometer. I can kind of beep, 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 beep. Right? It doesn't work like that, right? How do you get to be king? A king is a person (laughs) who stands on a stage and says, I am the king in front of an audience of people who also go, yes, you are the king. And Imagine if everybody king went to sleep at night and everybody got on the internet and was like, when this guy wakes up, he's not the king anymore. And then he gets up and he says, I am the king. And everybody goes, oh, that's adorable. <clears throat> that's so cute that you think that you're not the king. Because he would literally stop being the king at the moment people stopped calling him that. He would become the crazy person on the subway who rants and rants about, and you've seen these people on the subway that yell and scream that they're, and everyone goes, you're not Napoleon, right? But the king is a guy who says, I'm the king, and everybody says, yes, you are. And that's how authority works. Um, and Hamlet has realized the sort, of dis- the sort of disastrousness of realizing that underneath all of the things that sort of make sense to us, you can kind of cut, it's all about belief. And once you remove the belief, the whole system starts to crumble. Joker burns the money and the king is only the king by virtue of saying he's the king. And this is, by the way, why if you're the king and somebody says, no, you're not, what are you going to do with that guy? How are you going to kill him? Publicly. That's the crucial thing. You don't send assassins to that dude's house in the middle of the night. You drag him up on a stage and you make sure everybody sees him get his head chopped off, right? That's all right, that's the spoiler alert, like season one of Game of Thrones. Um, but you, you get you get him in front of everybody um, because 
it, the, that the person that says you're not the king is incredibly dangerous because he's like the Joker. He's realized this whole system is bullshit. And if he says you're not the king, and then he tells two people, and they say you're not the king, and then these two people tell two people each, and they say you're not, and then boom, 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 and pretty soon you wake up in the morning and you go, I'm the king, and everybody goes, oh, that's so sad. He thinks he's the king. Um, so the the what Hamlet has realized is a kind of like a radical nihilism, sort of at the heart of things. That that all of the things we believe in. Um, have power because we invest in them and we can remove that investment. Um, and it's a lesson, every time someone has power over you, you gotta look for the area, how did you give them power over you and can you kind of take it back? Um, and it's a, it's a dangerous idea and it's a radical idea because in the case of the Joker, it threatens to sort of undo all of civilization because the entire point of society is that we all got together and agreed on something. And people that don't agree to that, um, it begins to kind of crumble the whole system because they're because what Hamlet's figured out is he's revealing the the contingency, the radical contingency. All of the things that we think about as being necessary and solid and secure and eternal are like ideas that we had, right? Well, one of my favorite comic books, The Invisibles by Grant Morrison. I don't, I don't recommend it. I don't know. Would you recommend it? The art's so bad that I can't recommend it. But the last page, which has good art, um, but the last page has uh, one of the main characters says that when we were young and afraid, we invented gods because we felt scared and alone and we wanted to be punished. And then we forgot we invented them. <laughs> Um, <laughs> right, and then, and then we treat it like external things. Um, keep, keep an eye on people in your life who keep claiming things are happening to them and notice the ways in which they're causing it to, ha they're doing the thing. They, they interpret it like it's coming from the outside, um, but it's actually something they're causing to happen. Um, but they forget that they're the ones in charge. There's a great Onion headline that says, um, it's, uh, it's something like, woman has a terrible experience with wait staff at a restaurant because she is a terrible person. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, right? Like people who are constantly, there's a, there's, a great, there's a great phrase that I like, that if, if you meet an asshole, you met an asshole. But if everybody you meet is an asshole, you're the asshole. Right? Like you, you're doing that. If all of your ex-girlfriends are crazy, consider that you may have done that to them. What did you do? to cause them to freak out at you, you son of a bitch. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of, what Hamlet and Game of Thrones and Dark Knight all point out is this kind of, this kind of radical uh, sort of contingency uh, to the universe and the way that if you think about it, you can pull the whole thing down, which is terrifying, uh, but that's what power is. You, to, that, the reason we don't want the power is because we don't want the terrifying results of the power. And now I think I'm done. Right, that's it, right? No, I'm done. I'm done. No, I'm done. I'm done. That's it. I did 20 minutes. I got. You told me to do 20 minutes. I'm done. That's perfect. All right. Thank you. Right. That's 20 wow, minutes. That's right? I did. I can fit it. I can fit it in a thing. I don't know what we're doing. Next. Let's do. Do you want questions? We're doing questions? Yeah. Yeah. We'll do like two questions. Uh, raise your hand if you have one or two questions. And if you don't, by the way, I'm gonna hang out afterwards. I'm not going in. I'm not gonna like dive out. So I'm totally cool if you want to ask me if you have like a specific thing. There's a question right here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question is about, for me, when you were talking about these examples, money stood out as being one that felt like it had more power. Is, that, is there any examples of that? Is that true? Or is that just my interpretation of based well, on my belief? The physical bills aren't worth more than, right? I mean, it, right, but in, in terms of like, um, in this example, I, I was just like, most people I feel like would choose money. Yeah. Yeah, because it's because it, the, the, because we live in a capitalist society. So the whole point of the whole system is to get people to care about money all the time because that's how they get control over you, right? That's the whole thing of capitalism. I like like you ever heard you ever heard listen the phrase like listen to your mother. Who told you that? Was it your mom? Was it someone working for your mom? Do you know what I mean? Like, like, like that's, right? So like capitalism is, that's why they're constantly trying to sell you iPhones and tell you that money's super duper important. And it's also, by the way, why they really want you to go into debt. Because people in debt don't protest. Because what if you lose your job? You need the money. Because you're in debt. So a society where everybody's in debt 
means that people aren't going to protest and they're not going to fight back and they're not going to do the crazy thing and they're not going to do the amazing thing. They're going to do the, 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 the safe thing because they owe $100,000 in student loan bills. So you're going to get the safe, comfortable job and then you're going to be doing, you're going to do that, right? It's, it's like the, or, or it's like how a lot of bright young people are grabbed out of school um, and corporate America woos them. Actually, I guess the example I'm thinking of is in England, but they get wooed by some of the brightest graduates of the finest schools get wooed away by, oh, we, get, we can give you this nice thing and this nice thing and all these perks and benefits. Because what they really want you to do is buy the house. At which point, from that point forward, you're working for the house. Right, because you owe money on the house, and you owe money on the car, and you owe money on the 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 right, and then and then you then you can't. People go, well, I'm just gonna do it for a couple of years because it's good. But then you start you start buying the things, and then you can't get out of it. So the reason money feels like the biggest one is because we live in a capital society, and if we lived in a religious theocracy, that's the word, right? I went to college, right? So so if we live in a theocracy, you'd feel like the one that was most immovable was the God one. Right, because the the one that feels most immovable is the one that's the controlling umbrella term. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have another question? Oh, wait, wait. I don't know. We have an, I, does anybody else have? I don't know. I'll also be here later. So I don't know. Where is it? Oh, I got this. Kermit the Frog. Does. I like the way Kermit the Frog runs. <laughs> um. I, there's a question in here, but uh, just humor me. Uh, you know, talking about uh, the moment where you give someone or something power over yourself and sort of create your own situation, um, how does that, how does that iron itself out when the power was taken at a very young age? And 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 you, whether it's the environment or the people around you, one, you don't have the strength or the wherewithal or anything to get yourself out, but also you're surrounded in, an, in a place where you, you think and you believe because you have to that everything is there to protect you. So when something betrays that, how do you fix it? <laughs> oh, a oh, different one. Okay. Ooh, fancy. Ah! Okay. Um, I just yelled in my own ear. Um, the the right the the the, pro, the the problem is you need, you need numbers. It's the same thing with killing the king. If one guy goes, that's not the king. He's dead. But if a thousand, hundred thousand people do that, it gets bigger. The problem is is that the 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 blocks that you've invested in are so massive, and they've been there for so many thousands of years that it you don't believe. It's like right, it's like everybody's gonna get together and shave their head tomorrow, and then you show up at, at school and you're the only one who shaved your head, right? Like you you people don't trust that everybody's gonna move with them, so that you have to kind of build up huge numbers of people because some of the immovable ones, the ones that feel the most immovable, are really difficult because they've been they've been there forever. And one of my favorite examples of this. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates points out, um, and it's one of these kind of mind-blowing moments, um, is that like, again, all the, Hamlet's point, all the things you think of as solid categories are actually just made up shit. So for example, white people is a made up category, right? Like, and it's, and Ta-Nehisi Coates points out that like, you think white people has to do with like genetics or you can tell just by looking or, but no, actually, because for example, in the American South during the civil war, they had the sort of one drop of black blood and you were a slave. Well, who does that benefit? Well, it benefits the people who want the slaves. Um, and then the fact that like, are, are Jewish people white? Are Irish people white? Are Italian people white? Well, they weren't, I, right? Like uh, Irish people and Italians were not considered white at the beginning of the, the 20th century, and then then they are. Um, one of the one of the things CUNY, where I work at CUNY, actually, you might I don't know if you know this, Manny, but CUNY CUNY has a like a protected you know. Uh, I don't know, like a diversity hire, make sure you have groups, and they keep track of the numbers and the categories. And they, they want to have like a certain number of professors with certain kinds of racial backgrounds. And do you know the one area where we're deficient in? Is Italians, because years ago, Italians were like a protected class because they felt discriminated. Some of the old dudes in my English department still feel very discriminated against as Italian Americans. Um, and the one area where we don't meet the sort of criteria for diversity hires is Italians. And is the reason because no Italians are applying or we're being dismissive of Italians? No, it's because 
I guess I'm Italian, but I just wrote white people on my form and moved on. And that's why we're constantly under. So like these huge categories are hard to move because how many people would you need to get to believe that Irish people are white before they become white, you know? Like it's, it's, a, it's a numbers game. Right. I, I, um, I see all that. Um, I, I think also I'm wondering on, on it, like a more youthful sort of like for children. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes you don't recognize a lot of the constraints and or uh, missteps against you beca because you were too young. You just didn't have the scope to understand that's what was happening. And I feel similarly like that you need the numbers, but I feel like in today's age, we have the numbers in the form of data. So we should theoretically be able to start sort of like circumventing some of this behavior. Well, and and I, I think the thing, and it's true that like, one thing about young people that's interesting is that they, they a lot of them are too young to know to know they can't change things. So that's why the Parkland kids have been so amazing. And notice where the Parkland kids come from. They came from the same goddamn place Hamlet came from. They're theater kids. Of course they are. Of course the theater kids are the ones who realize that a person, a king is a king because he stands on a stage and says he's the king in front of a bunch of people who pretend to take it for that person. Of course it's the theater kids that understand that mechanism. And then people are like, oh, they don't know how powerful the NRA is. That's good that they don't know that because that's why they're fighting and getting larger groups. And it's the fact that they don't know the thing, which is contingent, right? With the old people being like, oh, they'll never change anything. The NRA is too powerful. Like you've bought into that story. They're, they're helpfully too young to have bought it because they all saw Hunger Games and they were like, we should overthrow this whole thing. Um, <laughs> right? I mean, that's why it's so amazing that she has the, the, the short hair, right? Because it's just like she's Furiosa and also uh, Negasonic Teenage Warhead from Deadpool and also, right? It's all of the like, right? These are, these are my heroes. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean that's that's the I mean that's the that's the power of youth, and it's why it's why adults are constantly telling kids to grow up and be realistic so that they won't do stuff like that. All right, I'm done. Thank you.